Okay. Hello, everyone. I think um, this is the start of the Q and A session. So, uh, people can just ask me questions uh, here, or I think maybe these questions are being are going to be read um, by someone. Yes. Thank you. Um, should I start doing that, or I also know that there's uh, questions in the um, the either pad room, so I could start out answering those as well. Right, sure, yeah, How, uh, whichever way you prefer. If you prefer to read the questions yourself, by all means, or if you would prefer me to read them to you, that also works. Oh, I see. Why don't you read them to me? I think it'll just be more interesting then. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, let's see. The first question is, uh, what is your use case for embedding, um, mainly for searching? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the use case really is searching. Um, and I think it's, it is very useful when you're searching for something in a vague way. It, it, there's, uh, just to give you an example, I, um, I use, um, I have a note system called EKG. I type all my notes on it. You can find it on GitHub and, um, Melpa, uh, but. I, I wrote something like at some point, like a year ago or something, I wrote something that I just vaguely remember, like, oh, this was about uh, a certain kind of communication. I wanted to like, uh, like communicating to large audiences. Like there's some interesting tip that I wrote down that was like really cool. And I, um, I was like, well, I need to find it. So just my, I did an embedding search for something like, uh, you know, tips for communicating. Like those, those words may not have been in what I was trying to find at all, but it was able to find it. And, and that is something that's very hard to do in, in other ways. Like, you know, if you had to do this with normal search, you have to do synonyms and like, maybe those synonyms wouldn't cover it. Like with embedding, you can basically get at like the vague sentiment you're like, you know, you're, you know, you can really query on like what things are about as, as opposed to what words they have. Um, also it's super good for similarity search. Um, so you could say like, look, I have a bunch of things that are in, in, uh, encoded with embeddings that I want to show. Uh, for example, you could you know you can make an embedding for every buffer, and you'd be like, well, show me show me buffers that are similar to this buffer. Like that doesn't sound super useful, but this is the kind of thing you could do. Um, and so, like if you have a bunch of notes um, or something else that you want to search on, you'd be like, what's what's similar to this buffer, or uh, what what notes are similar to each other, what buffers are similar to each other. Um, it's super good for this sort of thing, and it's also good for the. Um, this kind of retrieval augmented generation where you sort of, you retrieve things and your purpose is not for you to see them, but then you pass that to the LLM. And then it, it's able to uh, be a little bit more accurate because it, it has the actual text that you're trying to, uh, that that is relevant and, and it can cite from and, and things like that. And then this could give you a much better answer. That's kind of, uh, you know, not just from its own little uh, neural, neural nets and memory. Cool. Thanks. Let's see. Next question. Um, what do you think about um, em embed Emacs manual versus uh, GPT em uh, GPT's Emacs manual? Um, I'm not exactly sure what this question is trying to say. So, I mean, if someone if someone wrote that and wants to um, expand on it a little bit, but I think that maybe you're saying like you could embed have embeddings for like various like every paragraph or something of the emacs manual but it's also the case that like gpt is already for sure already read it right and so you could ask questions that are about e emacs and our elisp or whatever part of the manual you want to find and uh, it will it will do a reasonably good job especially the you know the better models will do a a reasonably good job of saying you something that is vaguely accurate um, but with you, if you do this retrieval augmented generation with embeddings, um, you can get something that is very accurate. Um, at least I think haven't tried it, but like, this is a technique that works in other similar cases. So, you know, you can also imagine like, oh, you know, this whole thing I said, like, oh, you can query for, you know, vague, vague things, uh, and, and get parts of uh, the manual perhaps. I'm not exactly sure if that would be useful, but maybe usually when I'm looking things up in the Emacs manual or Elist manual, I have something extremely specific and I kind of know where to look, but you know, this is uh, having other ways to get at this information is always good. Right. 
Looks like they added uh, a clarification if you would like to uh, read that yourself, or would you like me to read it for you? Uh, yeah. Um, yes, you OK, it says, I've never tried. Yeah, the question is like, OK, there, there is a difference between the kinds of things I just described. I have not tried the difference with the Emacs manual it's, itself. Um, it'd be interesting to see what this is. But I, I would expect, like these techniques, the retrieval augmented generation is generally um, pretty good. And I suspect it would, um, I would bet money on the fact that it's going to give you um, you know, better results than just you know doing a free form query without any retrieval augmented generation. Cool. Let's see. Next question: When deferring commit messages to an LLM, uh, what, if anything, uh, do you find you might have lost? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a good question. Like, there's when deferring anything to a computer. Like, you know, you, you I used to have to remember how to get places, and now, you know. Um, on the few occasions which I drive, like uh, it could just tell me how to get places. So um, similar things could occur here where like, okay, I'm just leaving the thing to the LLM. And so I'm kind of missing out on some opportunity to think coherently about a particular commit. Com particular commits are kind of low level. I don't think it's, it's usually relatively obvious and uh, what they're doing. and. and so in this case, I think there's not much loss. But for sure, in other cases, if you're starting to get into situations where you're, it's writing your emails and all this stuff, first of all, I, it's in one sense, I'm not sure you might be losing something by delegating things. On the other hand, you know, when you're interacting with these LMs, you have to be extremely specific about what you want, or else it's just not going to do a good job. Um, and that might actually be a good thing. So it, the question might be that maybe you might gain things by using an LLM to do your work. It might not actually even save you that much time, at least initially, um, because you have to be, you have to kind of practice and get super specific about the, what you want to get out of the output it's going to give you. Um, so like, oh, I'm, you know, maybe, you know, you're on the Emacs Devel um, mailing list and you're like, okay, uh, write this email about this, uh, about this, and here's what I want to say, and here's the kind of tone I want to use, and here's the, like, I'll, you know, you might want to specify like everything that you kind of want to get into this. Usually, it's easier just to write the email, but uh, I think that practice of kind of understanding what you want is not something you normally do, and I think it's, uh, I, I think it's going to be kind of an interesting exercise that will help people understand. That said, I haven't done that much of that. So I can't say like, oh, yeah, I've done this and it works for me. Maybe. I, I think it's an interesting thing to explore. Sure. Thanks. Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, can you share your font settings in your Emacs config? Those are some nice, uh, nice fonts for reading. Yeah, I think I, I, I think I was using Menlo at the time. Unfortunately, I don't save those kinds of things, like a history of this. I have kind of switched now to. Um, uh, what was that? I think I wrote it down in the, uh, I, I switched to Mona space, which just came out like a week or two ago and is also pretty cool. Um, so I think it's Menlo. The eternal question, what font are you using? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. It looks like someone guessed as well that it uh, might be Menlo. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. Next question. In terms of uh, standardiz standardization, do you see a need for um, a medium to large scale effort needed? Um, and then they also elaborate about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think, I, I don't know if it's large scale, but at least it's probably medium scale. There's a lot of things that are missing that we don't have right now in Emacs when you're dealing with LLMs. One is um, a prompting system. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, no, prompts are just like big blocks of text, but there's also senses that like prompts need to be composable and you need to be able to iterate on parts of the prompt. And so it's, you know, it's also, it's kind of customizable. Users might want to customize it. On the other hand, like it's not super easy to write the prompts. So you kind of want really good uh, defaults. So the prompts, the whole prompt system is kind of complicated. That is not, that needs to be kind of standardized because I don't think there's any tools for doing something like that right now. I use, I personally use um, my system EK, my note system for EKG. I don't think that's appropriate for everyone, but it does, I did write it to have some of these capabilities of composability that I think are useful 
for prompt generation. It'd be nice to have a system like that, but for general use. Um, I don't, this is something I've been meaning to think about, like how to do it, but like this, you know, if someone's interested in getting this area, like, uh, I would love to chat about that or, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas that we could have to have a system that allows us to, to make progress here. And also, um, I think there's more to standard standardization to be done. One thing I'd also like to see that we haven't done yet is a system for standardizing on getting structured output. This is going to be super useful. Um, I have this for open AI's API because they support it. And it's, re it's really nice because then you can write ELISP functions that like, okay, I'm, I'm going to call the LLM. I'm going to get structured output. I know what that structure is going to be. It's not going to be just a big blob of, te blob of text. I could turn it into a, you know, a plist or something, and then I could get the values out of that plist. And, and I know uh, that way I could do, I, I could write actual apps that are, uh, you know, very, very sort of, uh, you know, useful for very specific purposes and not just for, you know, text generation. And I, I think that's one of the most important things we want to do. Um, and I have some ideas about how to do it. I just haven't pursued those yet. And, but if other one, if other people have ideas, I think this would be really interesting to add to the LLM package. So, you know, contact me there. Awesome. A quick note before we continue. So I'm not sure how long we're going to be on stream for because this is the last talk before the break. Um, if we are on the stream long term, then great. But if not, folks are welcome to continue writing questions on the pad and hopefully Andrew will get to them at some point. Um, or if Andrew maybe has some extra time available and wants to stay on big blue button here, then folks are also welcome to join here and um, chat with Andrew directly as well. Um, yep. Let's see. Okay, awesome. So yeah, the next question is, what are your thoughts on the carbon footprint of uh, LLM usage? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I don't have any particular knowledge um, or opinions about that. It, it's something I should, I think we should all be educating ourselves more about. It is mm, really, there's, I mean, there's two parts of this, right? They take a, there's a huge amount of carbon footprint involved in training these things. Then running them is relatively lightweight. So the question is not necessarily like once it's, once it's trained, like, I don't feel like it's a big deal to keep using it, but like training these things is kind of like the big carbon cost of it. Uh, but like right now, the, the, the way everything's going, like every, uh, you know, all, you know, the top five or six tech companies are all training their LMs and this is all costing, you know, a giant amount of carbon probably but on the other hand, these, these, same companies are pretty good about using the least amount of carbon necessary. You know, they have their own, their tricks for doing things very efficiently. Cool. Uh, next question. Uh, LLMs are slow in, uh, or are slow in responding. Do you think Emacs should provide more um, async primitives to keep it responsive? Like the URL retrieve is quite bad at building API, uh, API clients with it. Um, yeah. Well, so, okay. So first of all, um, people should be using the LLM, um, client. Um, and I, so right now one, you know, one thing I, I should have mentioned at the top is that there are new packages that I, I recorded this talk that you just saw like, um, several months ago. And so like Elama, this, this, there's this package Elama that came out that is using the LLM package. And so it, like, for example, it doesn't need to worry about this sort of thing because it just kind of. It just uses LLM and package and the LLM package worries about this. Um, and while I'm on the subject of things I forgot to mention, I should also should, should just mention very quickly that there is now an open source model, Mistral. And so that's a kind of this new, this new thing on the scene that happened after I recorded my talk and I think is super important to the uh, community and important that we have the opportunity to use that if we want to. Um, okay, but to answer the actual question, there is some talk, there has been some talk about the problems with URL retrieve uh, in the URL package in general in Emacs Devel. It's not great. Uh, I would like to have better primitives. And uh, I've asked the author of Please PLZ to kind of provide some necessary callbacks. I think that's a great library. Um, and we, I'd like to see that kind of. Um, like it's nice that we have options, and that is an option that uses curl on the back end, and that that has some benefits. So there's this big 
you know, debate about the, whether, you know, whether we should have primitives or just use curl or, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the right call is, but it, it's, um, there has been discussions about this. Excellent. And someone commented that GPTL is async and apparently very good at tracking a point. So. Um, yes, yes. GPTL has similar functionalities to LLM, although I believe it's going to move to LLM itself um, sometime soon. Cool. Uh, next question. Uh, speaking of which, anyone trained or fine-tuned or prompted a model with their org data yet and applied it to interesting use cases like planning, scheduling, et cetera, and maybe care to comment? Uh, I don't know anyone who is doing that. I think it is interesting. Like this is what I kind of mentioned at the very end of the talk. There is a lot of stuff there. Like you could, you know, if you especially, I mean, an LLM can kind of work as sort of like a, a secretary kind of person that could uh, help you prioritize. I, I still, it's a slightly unclear how, what the best way to use it is. So I think there's more of a question for the community about like what people have been trying. I see someone is, has mentioned that they are using it for weekly review. And it's kind of nice to like, maybe it could, you know, read your agenda or maybe this for like weekly review. It could like read all the stuff you've done and ask you questions about it. And like, you know, what, what should happen next? Or like, is this going to cause a problem? Like I, I could, like, I can understand if, if that could happen, that's like, that's kind of nice. And this kind of, uh, people have had good success out of using, uh, these LLMs to bounce ideas off of or you know, for, you know, I've seen people say that like they want, they use it for reading um, and they kind of dialogue with the LM to kind of like um, do sort of active reading. Uh, so you could imagine doing something similar with your tasks where it's sort of you're engaged in dialogue about like planning your tasks with some, with a LLM that could kind of understand what those are and ask you some questions. I think it, uh, you know, if it'd be nice. So the problem is like there's no great way to share all this stuff i i guess like if you have something like this like put it on reddit if you don't have reddit i don't know what to do <laughs> i would say put it somewhere you could at the very least i could maybe open up like an llm discussion session on the uh, llm package github but not everyone likes to use github i don't know it'd be nice if there's a mailing list or or a irc chat for this sort of thing uh, but there isn't at the moment all right Let's see, I think that's the end of the questions on the pad so far. Um, there was also some discussion or some chatter, I believe, on IRC. I'm not sure. Andrew, are you on IRC right now? or? Uh, I am, but I don't think I'm on any place that has the chatter. So if there's chatter, then I'm not seeing it. OK. Yeah, it was in the emacsconf-dev uh, channel. Uh, OK, let me see if I can. Um... Oh yes, um, I, I mean I can see the channel, but I've I've you know, missed whatever came before. So if there's anything you want to kind of call out, I can try to answer it here. Okay, cool. I believe um, at least two other folks who are kind of participating in the discussion there, um, who uh, have also joined here on Big Blue Button, Code and Quark, and uh, Aeon Turn ninety two. So um, you folks, if you know Andrew is still available and has time. Um, you're welcome to chat here and ask her questions or discuss here as well. Thank you. Thank you for your help and thank you for um, you know reading all the questions. Cheers and thanks to you for a great talk and the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. So I'll just I will wait here and see if there's any questions. If not, I will log off after a few minutes. Um, well, uh, I guess since we were mentioned, like that, there was a small chat about uh, local LMs. Because uh, ChatGPT is nice, no, but and but privacy concerns and uh, it's not free and stuff. Which, so the question is, yeah. what what is the promise for like local models? Yeah, so like local is definitely, or well, at least open source. Yeah, so it's okay, so there is a local open source model, Mistral, which you could run uh, the LLM package allows you to use, uh, I think there's three uh, kind of local things you could use. Like like many of these things, there's like many kind of ways to do the same sort of thing. So um, I'm, LLM is supporting Olama and 
Llama CPP. And uh, let's see, one other, which one is it? Uh, and maybe that's it. Maybe this, oh, GPT for all. So each one of these kind of has slightly different functionality. Uh, so for example, I think GPT for all doesn't support embeddings. And uh, I hear that, that Olama's embeddings are kind of currently broken, but basically they should support everything. And the open source models are, um, are so the local models are reasonably good. Like, I don't think you'd use them and be like, what is, what is this horrible nonsense? Like it's, um, it gives you relatively good results. Like it's not going to be at the level of like GPT 3.5 or four, but it's not far away from GPT 3.5, I think. So also I understand that the uh, LM has like a presets for connecting the actual working servers for Llama. Uh, yeah. So you could, what you could do is you could like, for example, you could download Olama, which is just a way of um, setting up local models and running local models on your machine. So typically what it does, you like download a program, let's say Olama, then Olama will have the ability to download models. And so you could choose from just a host of different models. Each one of these things has a bunch of different models. So it downloads all these things to your machine. Um, but I would say that the key problem here is that you re it requires a fairly beefy machine. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, well, why I was asking because you briefly mentioned that there are some Israeli servers, and I um, understood that like they run it like a government or stuff like that. No, no, so sorry. I, everyone, everyone. I don't. I, I mean, I maybe you've said something that sounded like Israeli servers. I think okay, okay, okay. So I I, I, there's no government LLMs as far as I know. Um, although I'm sure the governments are working on their own LLMs, etc. But. Um, yeah, basically your choices are spend a, I mean, if you use open AI or something or anything else, you're really not spending any money. Like I've, I've never been able to spend any money on open AI. Um, like, unless you're doing something very intensive and really are using it to, to, you know, if you're using it for your personal use, it's just hard to spend any money. Um, but on the other hand, it's not free. So you can, you know, Oh, well, actually, uh, it, it's it's rather cheap. No, there's no question about that. Uh, the problem is that it has a bad track record on uh, privacy. Yes, that's. I think that is a key problem. This is probably the number one reason why you might want to use a a um, local AI, a local LLM. Um, another one is like you may not agree with the decisions. Um, you know, there's a lot of trust and safety stuff that. Uh, um, that these companies have to do, like they don't want like the LMs to kind of like give you, like tell you how you can make meth or, you know, how you can make a bomb, which they would do, they would totally do it. Um, so, but each time you, each time you kind of restrict what is happening with, you know, what you can get out of the LM, it gets a little worse. So people, you know, some people uh, want to have local... that, That's expected, uh, I yeah. guess, it's like even open source uh, language models will sooner or later face this because it's simply a legal issue. The, yeah, I think that's true, over. but I also think that there probably will be, although I don't know of any offhand that will are com like completely uncensored. I know people are interested and are running uncensored models. I don't know how to do it. I don't... I think it's a little bit dubious, um, but some people do want to do. There's another reason for using local um, servers. Do you have any recommendation for uh, models to run locally and, and also comments on whether a GPU is required? Uh, usually a GPU, well, you can run it without a GPU in my, but it does run much better. Um, like for example, I think when I used Llama is sort of like a standard. Uh, this is the model for that um, Facebook came out with for local use. And it was, mm, yeah, it's, it's good. It's, um, but it's now it's, I think Mistral is, is kind of, is kind of like has a better performance. There's, but there's also different model sizes. There's like 7B, like the Llama 7B is okay. The Mistral 7B, 7 billion are like, it basically will take like, um, you could run it with like 16 gigs of, of RAM is, is pretty good. It's probably about as equal to the 
a llama 13b, like those are the number of parameters, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, and then there's like a 70b, which I've never been able to run. Um, and if you, even if the 7b, if you run it without a GPU, it takes quite a while to answer. I think I've had experiences where it took literally like several, like five minutes before it even started responding, but you do eventually get something. Um, and I, it could be that like things have gotten better since the last time I tried this because things are moving fast. Um, but it is super recommended to have a GPU. This is the problem. It's like, you know, you have a, it's kind of like, yes, free free software is great, but like if free software is, is requiring that you have these kind of beefy servers uh, and like have all the, this hardware, that's not great. I yeah, think there's we'll, a case to we'll be. Move, move oh, I, I, ideally, with slots instead of a laptop. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Ideally, it would uh, be nice to like if FSF or for teams could run uh, something for open source uh, model and not free, but the key point is that it's Libra. Yes. So actually, I think Google Google does do that. If I, I'll have to look it up, but I I, I haven't explored this yet. But Google's uh, server, which LLM does support supports arbitrary models. So you could run Llama uh, or things like that. The problem is that even if you're running Mistral, which has no restrictions. So this is the kind of thing that like the Free Software Foundation cares a lot about. Like you, you want it to be like no, no restrictions, legal restrictions on you as you run the model. So even if you're, it's running Mistral, just by using the server, this co the company server, it will impose some restrictions on you probably, right? There's going to be some license that you have to or some you know something you have to abide by so i think yes you depends on how much you care about it i guess i should um i should find out more about that and make sure that um it's this is a good point that i should you know people should be able to run free models over the over server so i should make sure we support that in the LL, in the llm package Uh, so is there any other questions or um, or is um, otherwise we can end the session? Someone is typing. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone who listened. Uh, I'm super happy like, uh, I, the interest is great. I, I think there's great stuff to be done here, and I'm kind of super excited what we're going to do in the next year. So hopefully, like next year in the conference, we have something even more exciting to say about LLMs and how they can be used with Emacs. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>